I love the chase and the hunt and I set the pace when I'm running. I always take what I want and I always give it 100. Don't need a bank, no, I'm funded. Play the game like it's nothing. I'm always thankful for something. Don't take for granted, stay humble. Now waiting, better believe in your mind cause it's everything. You can mold, shape, find almost anything. Hey everybody, this is Praxis, and in this video we are talking about how to predict the future. And that's a really important thing to be able to do if you're into prepping and preparedness. Because the whole idea of prepping and preparedness is looking out into the future, thinking of uh, you know, issues, threats, dangers that might be out there, and taking precautions against them. And the better you are at figuring out what the actual dangers are going to be, the more you're going to be able to focus your resources and your time into the things that actually happen. An example would be, like, if I'm living in a place like this, and I'm really focused on the idea that there could be a wildfire come th coming through, there's all sorts of things that I might do to try to mitigate the idea of uh, you know, dealing with a wildfire coming through the area, but what if the real thing that ends up happening is we never end up, end up having a, wi a wildfire and we have a flood, and the, a flood is the big issue that I have to deal with. There are different things that you would need to do if you're facing a flood versus a wildfire. Now, as a prepper, you think you'd probably want to kind of cover both of those bases, but the idea is, is if there is something that is very likely and something that is not very likely, you're going to want to spend more time and effort and energy and resources uh, focusing on that thing that is, you know, most likely to happen because, you know, it's Oh, hey, it's mostly likely to happen. Look at this. Got a little frog right here. Right on the, uh, right on the leaf. These are cute little guys. Little spring peepers. All over the place. Anyway. It's important to be able to kind of figure out generally what's coming in the future so that you can kind of plan against it. That's what it means to be a prepper, is to look into the future, figure out what's likely to happen, and plan against it. There's all sorts of things that could happen, like we could have a giant invasion from space. You know, aliens could invade Earth by airdropping bird flu infected clown zombies. You can't say that there's a 0% chance of that happening. There's some uh, percent chance that something like that could happen. But it's not very likely, so it's not something that I actively prep and prepare against, despite how frequently I referenced it here on my channel. So that's what we're going to talk about today. I am going to be making a prediction during this video. Uh, I'm going to be making a prediction about central bank digital currencies. Those are also known as CBDCs. I'm going to talk about whether I think that those are going to be implemented and if they are going to be implemented, exactly how they're going to be implemented. Because if you know anything about CBDCs, they sound pretty awful to most people. The idea that the government can just turn off your money. I mean, who wouldn't want to sign up for that? But I think that there are ways of making it very appealing, and I'm going to be talking about some of those ways that you might want to look out for, uh, you know, going on into the future. So we're going to talk a little bit about those predictions later on. But first, I want to talk about how I make predictions about things. There are a couple different factors that are important to consider when you're thinking about uh, you know, what might happen in the future. And I think that the, the critical thing is to identify the players, the people that are involved in this, and figure out what their intentions are, what their uh, motives and desires are, and what their uh, capabilities are, what they're actually able to, uh, you know, to get accomplished. Because all of those things, all of those factors are critical. You know, what people want directs what they try to accomplish and what they're capable of accomplishing, uh, you know, ends up deciding what's actually relevant to them, which is what actually ends up happening. Uh, just as a kind of an example, I, one thing that I see here going on uh, in the YouTube community a lot is me people making predictions about the idea that COVID lockdowns are coming back. I've been seeing this for months and it just seemed really detached from reality, the idea that, uh, you know, these lockdowns at the levels that they were seen at before at the, um, uh, you know, at that official public governmental institutional uh, level uh, that they were going to be, you know, as widespread and ubiquitous as they were in the past. Uh, you know, I think it's you know, it's likely that some specific institutions, like you know, like nursing homes and things like that, might have some masking requirements or, or whatnot. But uh, you know, in terms of them being like they were before, I just see that as being very far-fetched. Um, and yet, it's you know, it's a common thing that every single day I, I pop onto YouTube and I'll see a new video about people talking about these coming lockdowns and and mandates and, and, and whatnot. And I just don't think that's very likely. Now, what, what is that divergence between myself and so many other people in the community? Uh, is it just that I'm not paranoid enough? Um, whether you're paranoid enough or not, I don't really think makes a lick of difference uh, in terms of uh, you know whether you are effective at planning for the future. What's important about planning for the future is whether or not you're accurate. And I'm not going to go patting myself on the shoulder, but I'll pat myself on the shoulder and say I'm pretty darn accurate when it comes to these things. Uh, 
there's oftentimes uh, situations where I just won't make a call because I, I just say, well, you know, it's really 50-50. I don't know which way this one's going to go. Uh, but when I do tend to get a sense of the direction that things are probably going to be taking, uh, I'm almost always correct about that. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't say that to, like, you know, aggrandize myself or anything, but just to suggest that the system that I'm using uh, is apparently, it would seem, uh, pretty effective, and that's why I wanted to to share it with you guys in this video and it really starts with that sense of you know wh who are the players what do they want what are they capable of achieving um, what one example uh, of uh, that kind of playing out in real life in the past was uh, you know during the recent uh, you know COVID lockdowns that actually did happen uh, and, and during that whole time period one of the big promises that the government said that they were going to uh, be achieving was that uh, there was going to be a vaccine released and it would you know, it would stop the uh, stop the spread, right? Uh, you know, uh, stop. The, yeah, that was that was a slogan they kept using. You got to stop the spread by um, uh, you're using this vaccine. So they promised that this vaccine was going to come out and it would you know prevent people from getting the illness. Now, uh, when I looked at that claim, uh, I looked at it through the lens that I you know just described to you guys. Look at the major players, who's involved in this. You know, what do they want, uh, and uh, you know, what are they capable? Of achieving, and uh, it's important to get down to the root of, of, of those questions. Now, uh, with the vaccine uh, question, uh, I think it was absolutely um, uh, obvious <laughs> that pharmaceutical companies would want to create a vaccine because they could sell that vaccine. And in fact, that was one of the reasons why I thought it was really unlikely that they were going to be able to develop one. Uh, which is the second component. You know, what do they want? What do they want to achieve? Uh, and what are they capable of achieving? I thought it was highly dubious that they would be able to be capable of achieving that because that has been a goal that the pharmaceutical industry has wanted to achieve and has tried to achieve many, many times in the past. Coronavirus is just a version of the common cold. It's a novel version of the, of the uh, coronavirus, which ca causes common colds. Uh, and there have been many attempts to make vaccines for that in the past. Can you imagine the uh, enormous amount of money that a pharmaceutical company could make if they did develop a vaccine that blocked people from getting the common cold? You know what? You don't even have to imagine it because, uh, you know, we saw over the past couple of years, if someone claimed to have created something along those lines, you saw the amount of money that they could make. And they knew that there was that much money in it. And for decades and decades, they did not release, they never released anything that claimed to be a, uh, you know, a vaccine against the common cold because they tried and they realized it just wasn't possible. The, the coronaviruses just mutate so quickly that, that while they could kind of target one strain of it, uh, you know, it would just, it would, uh, you know, break out and it would, uh, you know, attack the population in a new way. And it just wasn't an effective way of trying to deal with it. They just couldn't do it. So when the government announced that they wanted to, uh, in within like one year or was it 18 months or something like that, uh, that they were going to achieve something that had never been achieved before, even though there were millions and billions of dollars uh, waiting to be awarded to anybody that could achieve it, that they were going to achieve that in 18 months. I was highly incredulous that that was going to play out. Now, a lot of the population just swallowed that. They were like, oh, that's, that sounds perfectly plausible to me. And, uh, and they um, kind of played along because in, in the end, what people had to do was change the definition of what it meant uh, to be a vaccine. Uh, you, you know, in the past, the common understanding of a, what a vaccine is, is that something that you take that essentially makes it so that you can't contract whatever illness it was that, uh, you know, the thing was targeting. And that def the, the very definition of what it means to have a vaccine had to be changed in order for this thing to, uh, you know, to fit into that box. So that was an example where uh, people had the opportunity to predict the future. Is the government or is the government not going to be able to develop this thing? I looked at the players and I looked at what they uh, were likely capable of doing and I determined that that was not going to be what happened in the future. And again, like, it didn't. Uh, in order for people to claim that that happened, they had to change the definition of what it meant to create a vaccine. Um, in all of that uh, environment between that and the masks and everything, and I should say, uh, you know, just very, very briefly, I'm not anti-mask at all. In fact, uh, masks were one of the uh, implements that I used to avoid g uh, ever getting uh, COVID or any other illness. In fact, for the, fa the past four years, we've been 100% uh, communicable disease-free 
for the last four uh, cold and flu seasons. So something that we're doing uh, is working. Masks are part of that. And uh, it is my opinion that masks, if used properly, which the public clearly does not know how to do, masks, if used properly, can be a part of that whole package. And I, I'm gonna tell you, I love not being sick anymore. I used to get like one or two colds of flu a year. I've got a kid, so you know, uh, it, that, that kind of stuff would spread around. Made a couple small tweaks at the beginning of COVID and boop, nothing. So. Um, again, uh, the ability to discern reality from fantasy, reality from lies, it's a really critical skill to have because it can yield you wonderful benefits like having food during an emergency, like never getting sick anymore, like, uh, the list goes on and on. It's, it's a critical thing to be able to discern fact from fiction and reality from non-reality. And it really comes down to just those couple of things that I mentioned. Figuring out who are the players, what do they want, and what are they capable of achieving. And that is really where I think a lot of people have trouble because uh, people, some, people frequently uh, confuse uh, the idea of what they think someone wants with what they actually want. And that is one thing that I think is being confused during this idea that there's going to be a return to lockdowns for COVID is that uh, people presume that the administration wants to lock people down. And I presume that's not the case because uh, administrations tend to do best when people are happy and the economy is uh, you know, rolling really well and that's how they tend to get reelected and that's how they tend to keep their influence and that's how they tend to, if they're uh, predisposed in this direction, to uh, you know, take advantage of their influence for their own corrupt uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, interests and whatnot. Uh, the idea that a administration would want to lock people down and make them unhappy, it just doesn't make sense to me. And I think that a lot of people confuse the idea that because they think someone wants something, that they actually want that thing. So that's the first distinction that needs to be made. It's just because you think someone wants something doesn't mean that they actually want that. You have to look at the person's interests and figure out what is actually going to benefit them the greatest because people generally work in their own self-interest. Maybe not in their own long-term self-interest, but certainly in their own short-term self-interest. People are pretty predictable in, in the idea that they are going to uh, you know, do things that are gonna benefit them and like the close group of people around them uh, in the short to midterm. Uh, so that's a critical uh, part of this whole thing is accurately ascertaining what people's desires are. So that's the first mistake I think a lot of people make when they talk about the idea that these lockdowns are gonna be coming right back. Um, the second mistake that I think a lot of people make is uh, in regards to what people are capable of. And this is a big one in the prepping and preparedness community. Uh, the idea that there is this all-powerful cabal of people somewhere, the, the they's out there, that uh, can essentially do anything that they want, whenever they want, and uh, they're, they're capable of accomplishing anything that they want. And that just doesn't comport with reality in, in my estimation. People uh, may have desires, they may want to do something, but very frequently they're not able to do that thing. Um, and that plays right into the idea again of uh, the COVID lockdowns. Uh, in order for that to work, the first time I think people kind of had the sense that um, pretty much immediately, I think a lot of people understood that the thing wasn't working uh, super well, but it almost had the the uh, the feel of you know if somebody gets swindled if they if they you know make some deal and it's like a really bad trade and people kind of make fun of them for having made that bad trade. There's a um, there's a, there's a reluctance on the part of the person that that has been swindled to admit that they've been swindled. They you know they oftentimes will kind of defend the trade or defend the person. Um, who initiated the trade, you know, defend the swindler, uh, because they don't want to admit that they were fooled in that way. And I think a lot of that kind of plays into what happened during COVID, is that uh, it, it, it became at least subconsciously uh, obvious to people uh, that, you know, a vaccine is not something that you take and still get the illness. Uh, that, uh, uh, you know, a lot of these measures, uh, they, they weren't actually achieving any of the goals that they were setting out to achieve. You know, in terms of uh, the the uh, the level of risk to the general population from COVID, it became pretty clear pretty early on that what had been advertised as what the risk to the general population was, was not accurate. And at least on a subconscious level, I think a lot of people kind of perceive that, but they had that kind of, uh, the remorse of the swindled person, and they didn't want to admit that they'd been swindled that time around. But 
even if you're one of those people that is in denial that you've been you know, swindled by somebody, it's very unlikely that you're going to go back and be swindled by that specific person again. There may, there's plenty of swindlers out there and you know, you sound like, uh, you know, if you're in that situation, you're probably one of those fools born every minute and there's, you know, uh, somebody else out there to take you for a rube, uh, as uh, they said in the 1920s or whatever. Um, but you're very unlikely to, uh, to swallow the same exact uh, swindle from the same exact person again. And for that reason, I think that it'd be very unlikely that people would uh, be politically agreeable to jumping into lockdowns again. I, uh, th th that is my feeling. I, uh, and I think between the, the, the fact that there is not a lot of desire on the part of politicians to do that again, and uh, the general public is very unenthusiastic about the idea, I just don't see that as being something that is uh, you know, very likely to happen. And you know, I could be wrong about that. There's always a chance that you could be wrong about your guesses, and I, uh, I freely admit that. I don't tend to be, and I think that I'm correct about this one, that, you know, that is not going to be an issue that we're going to have to face this fall uh, or, or, or going through into the winter or anything like that. Um, but that's how I make my decisions. I look at the players. I look at what they actually want based on their actual uh, drives and their, their history and history of similar people in their circumstance, and I kind of cross that with you know, what they're likely capable of pulling off because all those things are critical. So I mentioned I was going to make a prediction about uh, CBDCs at the end of this video. Uh, CBDCs are central bank digital currencies, if you're not familiar with them. They are, they're kind of like a, uh, kind of like a Bitcoin, but, um, you know, endorsed and controlled by uh, central governing authorities. My belief is that we are going to start pushing into the, that realm. Uh, of, of having CBDCs be a part of people's lives. Uh, I don't feel that there is going to be like a ban on cash um, because I feel like there'd be a lot of backlash against that and I don't feel like it's, it is necessary. And the reason I don't think it's necessary to ban cash is because of the reason why uh, central banks and governments want to have um, digital currencies. They, they don't want them because they you know, just want to get rid of the paper dollars that we use. The reason they want them is because they want to have more leverage. They want to have more control over the system. Uh, what we've been doing since uh, you know the United States and the West has kind of decoupled itself from gold and we're like a purely fiat currency at this point, uh, there are certain tools that you can use to manipulate that currency. Mostly it's things like interest rates. And because of the massive debt that we have accumulated, among many other factors, uh, we are kind of reaching the end of our ability to use the tools that work for the system that we've been having uh, for those tools to be effective anymore. Uh, you know, the central bankers are starting to uh, lose the ability to control the economy in a way that they feel is required to keep it uh, stable. And stable, for their definition of stable, is not your definition of stable. Uh, their definition of stable is that your, um, uh, your wealth is slowly being eaten away over time so that uh, you'll constantly want to reinvest that wealth into the system before it loses uh, its, its value and uh, you know, they can keep the economy kind of churning in, the, in that way. Um, so their desire isn't you know, just some like, Orwellian kind of desire to get rid of, of cash because they, they hate you know, paper cash, uh, but their desire is for control. Uh, and in order to control the system, they don't really need to get rid of all the cash at all. All they need to do is make it so that most people, the majority of the system, is using these CBDCs. So they don't need to ban cash, they just need to get most people into the system. And the way that I think they're going to do it is this, because there are a lot of negative things about uh, CBDCs that uh, the average person can understand, I think, because the main reason to implement a CBDC is so that you can take the control away from the, the consumer, like the average person. You can take the control about decision making, about how much money they want to spend and uh, when they want to spend their money. You can take that kind of control from them and you can transfer that control to the bank. And that's not a very appealing idea for those customers because, uh, you, well, you're taking some of their decision making power away from them. So like who would just sign up for that uh, freely? I think a lot of people are going to sign up for it freely and I think that it's going to be implemented in two different ways and these are the two different ways that I think that you should look out for uh, in terms of you know when this is going to uh, start being implemented because I do believe it uh, the central banks and the governments believe it needs to be Im implemented because they are losing control of the system as it is and if they lose control of the financial system then 
they're not, they're not going to be able to placate the public in the way that they feel is required um, and I think is required in order to prevent things like revolutions and rebellions from happening. They need control over the system uh, and the only way to get that control at this point is to have a paradigm shift to a different type of system and that is where the CBDCs come in. Uh, one thing that they, you can do with CBDCs, again if you're not super familiar with them, is that they can uh, uh, stamp a like a a unit, of, I'm not sure what the units of money will be called, it'll be something very close to the US dollar so people don't feel like it's something very different. In fact they may just call them dollars but in fact they'll be something different because they're not going to want people to feel like there's a big uh, paradigm shift happening. Um, but one thing that they can do is they can stamp these uh, CBDC uh, dollars uh, with things like expiration dates uh, and they can make it so that like you know if you don't use this dollar by a certain um, uh, date it's going to lose its value by a certain amount. Like, uh, you know, that dollar is only going to be worth 90 cents in, in a year. And that will incentivize you to reinvest that dollar back into the economy. It's what, you know, what so many of us preppers are talking about right now with food is like, you know, whenever you can take your, your money, your, your money which is losing value against food and invest it in food now, lock it in at the prices now, um, you know, that, that's a good idea. And a lot of preppers are doing that because it makes financial sense because, you know, why buy... Uh, you know, one pound of, uh, or I'm sorry, why not buy one pound of flour now for a dollar uh, if you know that like, you know, a year from now you can only buy 0.9 pounds of flour for that same dollar. So it makes sense to invest early and that is what the CBDCs will allow the central government to, uh, uh, to do is to do that for any number of things where people will feel incentivized to they earn that money and it's literally like, no, not literally, figuratively, burning a hole in their pocket and they need to, you know, put that right back into the economy because, you know, if they don't do it today, they're gonna, not going to be able to buy as much with it tomorrow. So that, that is one of the, you know, the primary things, uh, the primary, to primary tools that the uh, central banks are going to be able to use is these kind of expiration date uh, kind of ideas that are stamped to uh, digital currencies. And uh, it's my understanding that China is already um, experimenting with this and using the idea of expiration dates to try to, you know, like throttle up or throttle down their economy. Um, so why would anybody choose to get into that, uh, like in terms of predicting the future? Like, what, you know, how can I, how can I say that I think it's likely that something like that's going to be implemented because it sounds so unappealing? Like, why, why would you take uh, something that you have more control over and trade it for something that you have less control over? Well, I think it's going to happen in two ways. Uh, one of them is going to be a carrot, and one of them is going to be a stick. Let's talk about the stick first. The stick is just going to be the simple inconvenience. I think uh, across the board, more and more, it's going to just be more inconvenient to use dollars for things. If like you want to pay for something in dollars, like if you want to, like say, like pay a tax bill or something like that, they're going to make it so that like you know you have to physically go to. Uh, you know, some, some location, you know, it's a, it's a place you're going to have to drive to and there's like a special place where you are going to be allowed to use those dollars, but it's going to be kind of like a pain in the butt. Like if you compare it to kind of like a grocery store, uh, you know, you have, uh, you know, lots of checkout lanes and maybe they'll just have one ch uh, checkout lane where you're allowed to use cash. So, uh, you know, if you want to, if you, if you want to keep continuing doing uh, your transactions in U.S. dollars, there'll be one checkout lane for you, uh, for a while anyway. Uh, and, um, you know, th that, that check lane, like at least at the beginning, is always going to have like the long line. So that's going to be an incentive to try to get into, uh, you know, some of these things because like, well, you know, if I just converted things into the, this, um, this digital currency, I'd be able to use any of these other, other lines uh, and it would just be a lot easier. So there's going to be that inconvenience factor that I think is going to be built into it. And, uh, and, and that, that's kind of coming at it from two different levels. You know, some of it is just automation and streamlining, uh, you know, so that kind of stuff makes sense. But it's also going to have that kind of uh, incentivizing um, force where, you know, if you, don't, if you don't play along, it's going to be kind of a, a pain in the butt for you because you're trying to do things in a way that people are going to consider, quote unquote, weird. Um, so that's the, that's the stick. Now the carrot, the carrot, I think, is more interesting. Uh, like, how are you going to incentivize people to... Uh, to you know, want to do this jump, not to make it so it's like they're like, ah, I don't want to do this, but I, you know, I, I you know, I got to do it because it's just such a pain in the butt. Uh, what is the carrot going to look like? Well, what I think the carrot is going to look like relates to what I mentioned about the idea that these currencies can be kind of throttled up and down in their uh, perceived value to people. Uh, that you know, if you don't you you, know, you don't use this this you know digital dollar by you know X date, it's going to you know lose its value of of a certain amount. Um, 
the carrot that I think is going to get used to initially start uh, getting people into the system is that they're probably going to be um, uh, kind of promotions or offers where you'll have an opportunity to turn your uh, your dollars into these like other dollars you know they, they, again I, I don't think they'll use a profoundly different uh, term for it but you'll be able to uh, like kind of digitize your dollars into this new thing which will sound a lot like the old thing and they're going to give you extra dollars if you do that so the, the example would be uh, there might be a promotion and it says like uh, if you trade you know trade in your you know, US currency for this kind of other currency uh, by X date, like they'll give you like, you know, a year or several months to do it or something like that. Uh, instead of giving you, uh, you know, one dollar for every dollar that you trade in, we'll give you like, let's just say like a dollar and ten cents. So they'll give you like a 10% boost. Uh, it's like kind of offering to give people free money if they do the trade. Um, and I think that that is going to drive a lot of people into it, uh, it especially dur during that kind of... Uh, uh, promotional kind of offer where it's like you know you want to do it by this certain date otherwise you know the the trans uh, the transfer rate after that point is going to be just you know one to one so you only get one digital dollar for every um, you know you know paper money I, I know paper money is already pretty much digital as it is anyway but um, uh, so you're losing out on that opportunity I think that that is probably going to get an awful lot of people into the system and at that point they would probably reevaluate at that time whether they need to uh, you know make any changes that might be all the carrot that they need and then the rest can kind of be stick after that because remember they don't have to get everybody uh, out of cash they just need to get the majority of the population out of cash and into the digital currency in order to um, to manipulate the market in a way that's effective in the same way that once the, uh, the US decoupled itself from cash uh, I'm sorry de decoupled itself from gold you could still have people that you know, were diehard gold addicts, and they, you know, they wanted to just keep doing their their transactions in, in uh, you know, gold-backed currency. And you could have those people, and they could still exist in the population, but they didn't really make any uh, a difference um, to the entire system if they remained a minor minority. Um, and that's all that the C uh, CBDC planners really need to do. Is they just need to have people using the pre the pre-existing currencies become a minority and have the majority of people. Uh, you know, signing into that uh, digital system, and then they'll kind of just slowly weed out the rest of us over time with that stick. So that's the thing to look out for, is if you see a promotion that says you're going to get like, you know, say like a dollar ten for every, uh, you know, a dollar that you trade in, that's kind of this, uh, that I think that that is going to be kind of the, the opening volley of this transition. And I think a lot of people are going to be into that because uh, a lot of people already are, are, are into digital uh, digital money because you know with credit cards uh, I know for myself I I have a wallet and I have uh, cash in my wallet and I uh, have my EDC pack and I have cash in my EDC pack but I'll be honest with you I haven't touched any of those since uh, forever I mean it's been years I've, I've had the same I think I have like $16 in my wallet and I think I, I've had the same $16 in my wallet for years because I uh, you know I just tend to use credit cards and the reason I use credit cards is for a very similar reason that I described the uh, a lot, why a lot of people would want to do this jump into the digital currencies is because it feels like you're getting free money uh, doing it that way. Uh, when I buy something with my credit card, I'm not one of those people that carries a balance. Like every every month, I pay it off, so I I, I never have to pay any interest on anything that I buy with my credit card. Um, and I have a credit card that gives me like I think it's like two percent back on groceries and two percent back on gasoline. So I am. I'm disincentivized from using paper currency because I know that I will be able to get uh, you know more stuff for less money if I use my credit card for things. So I've been incentivized to use that credit card all the time because it makes all my grocery purchases 2% cheaper, it makes all my gas purchases 2% cheaper, um, and uh, because of that, you know, I, I use the credit card for things. Now, if everybody collectively just stopped using credit cards, the prices of everything could go down because the processing fees and everything uh, related to credit cards causes um, you know stores to raise their prices. The, the stores have to raise their prices in order to um, uh, compensate for the transaction fee that comes with the credit card company and um, and you know the percentage that's charged on every uh, transaction and all that. So if collectively we all just went back to cash it could make everything cheaper again because that whole system that is pulling money out of the system, uh, you know, all those companies that make money off of the system, they wouldn't be drawing money out of the system anymore. That would stay in the hands of, the, you know, the consumers and the shopkeepers and everything. 
Um, but because we get that kind of 2% incentive, it, uh, it's enough to at least make people like me, you know, always use my credit card for things. And that's just 2%. And really, realistically, the central uh, banks could offer any kind of a transfer rate. I just hypothetically said maybe they'll give you a 10% bump or something like that. Apparently 2% would be enough to, you know, to get me to, to sell out into that system. Um, but it really, it honestly could be any amount because the value of these currencies is completely arbitrary. Uh, like they, they could at the beginning say they'll give you double. You know, for every dollar you put in, we'll give you two dollars of this digital currency. You know, what a mad dash that would be, uh, you know, if you, if you felt like you could get this, um, this huge deal. Now, the effect of that is that it's just going to create more inflation in the system because they would just be creating all these fake dollars, so the prices of everything would just go up. So the, the amount of the inflation will go up um, more depending on what that initial kind of, um, that percentage kind of deal that they're giving people is but it really that, that percentage could be anything and all it's going to impact is the uh is, is prices on the other side and as long as they can get a heck of a lot of people into the system it's not really going to matter if there are a couple of holdouts so that is my prediction on cbdc's that is how i make predictions is think about the players think about what they want what they really want what their actual motivations are and what their capabilities are uh, you have to bear all those in mind because just because you think someone wants something doesn't mean they do want it and just because uh, somebody does want something doesn't mean they're capable of getting it you bear those things in mind and I don't know if you're anything like me you're gonna get awfully effective at predicting the future that's it thanks for watching hey YouTube preppers if you like this video here's another one that I think you're gonna like but before you click on that one make sure you like comment and subscribe on this video